All right, good morning. Let's go ahead and get take our seats. We have a great panel here today for us. Um, I'm Aaron Farmer, the 2016 president of the Austin Board of Realtors, and I want to thank all of you for joining us today here at the Canyon View Event Center, which, by the way, is available for your companies to rent and have events here. Um, and you do get a member discount, so if you're looking for, for nice, nice events, we can break this off into three different rooms if you need to. So um, I can't wait uh, for you to, to hear our all-star panel today. As Central Texas Realtors, we have all experienced the incredible growth across our region, and as a result, we're subject to just about every technology and hot topic that real estate has to offer. However, as you know, we brokers never stop evolving. The success of our panelists have required them to be creative, technology-driven, aggressive, and agile. While they have some of the same attributes, they are very different in their approach to the market. But before we introduce our, our uh, panelists, I'd like to inform you of some other programming we have here, coming up here at, at ABOR. On uh, Thursday, December 1st, is RPR Day. If those of you, those of you that are interested in learning more about RPR, um, we have three different sessions for commercial, for broker manager tools, and on becoming a power agent. So our, if you're interested in RPR, um, check that out. Um, today is the first day that the Austin Board of Realtors is starting their Habitat for Humanity Home Blitz Build for the Zerhan family. So if you're interested in, in helping out uh, a needy family for Christmas uh, get a new home, uh, please go to our website. And then finally, on January 21st is our 2017 installation and 2016 installation awards celebration at the JW Marriott, uh, where, where Brandy Guthrie uh, will take over my role in 2017. Um, we also have uh, the, the 2016 industry awards, so the uh, Realtor of the Year and the Affiliate of the Year and all those uh, will be announced at, at this event on January 21st. You can find out more about these events on abor.com. All the speakers I'm about to introduce on today's, panels, on today's panel are well-respected speakers um, on a national real estate industry level. The ideal for this forum came about because we realized how many of these speakers we've been listening to at conferences and conventions over the years have a direct connection and interest here in Austin. This panel is not meant to be is, is meant to be a look into the future of things we might see soon in our industry. ABOR does not endorse any of these companies represented here today and recognize there are many great things, many other great companies in Austin doing great things. First, please help me welcome Austin's very own Jonathan Boatwright as our first panelist. Jonathan is the co-owner of Realty Austin, one of our fastest growing brokerages with 365 agents. After spending 16 years as an IT professional with Apple, Motorola, and Microsoft, Jonathan decided to trade in his employee badge for a blue Realtor R. <laughs> Inman News has recognized him as a top innovator in a, and appeared on the Swanepoel Power 200 list of the most powerful people in real estate. He has also graciously volunteered his time and service to the Austin Board of Realtors MLS Advisory Committee. We became interested in adding Jonathan to this panel when we listened to him discuss the ways in which strong technology knowledge has become one of the best skill sets for building a real estate brokerage of tomorrow at the T3 Summit. Welcome, Jonathan. Next up, please help me, help me welcome the CEO of Redfin, Glenn Kelman. Prior to joining Redfin, Glenn was the co-founder of Plum Tree Software, a publicly traded company that created the enterprise portal software market. At different times during his seven years at Plum Tree, Glenn led engineering, marketing, product management, and business development. Redfin got its start inventing map-based search, but they couldn't stop thinking about how different, how different real estate would be if it were designed from the ground up using technology. They've serviced over 50,000 customers nationwide, representing over 25 billion in sales. Redfin.com is consistently recognized as a nat on national stages 
as the brokerage website that competes with the portal giants like Zillow and Realtor.com. We wanted to bring Glenn to Austin after observing his presentation at the annual Cove conference where he discussed how MLSs can help brokerages succeed in the online market space. Welcome, Glenn. Thanks. Our next panelist is an exemplary industry veteran. Please welcome Russ Cafano, President and General Counsel of EXP Holdings. <laughs> Prior to joining EXP, Russ was the Senior Vice President of Industry Relations for Move Inc., the operator, former operator of Realtor.com. Russ was instrumental in reinvigorating Realtor.com's relationship with associations and MLSs and was a key influencer in Realtor.com product improvements. Prior to Realtor.com, Russ served as the CEO for the Missouri Realtors Association and as the Vice President and General Counsel to John L. Scott Real Estate, which is consistently ranked as one of the largest brokerage companies in the nation. In addition to that history, Russ is also a noted author, speaker, and consultant in the organized real estate space. Russ got, got us excited about bringing him to Austin when he provided a presentation at Inman Connect in San Francisco, providing his perspective and answering the question, should real estate be reorganized? Welcome, Russ. Our final panelist lives and works right here in Austin. She is the Vice President of Industry Development for Keller Williams Realty International and a newly minted ABOR member. Please welcome Carrie Sylvester. <laughs> Carrie works to ensure that KW is an innovative leader that helps solve problems and drive change in our industry. She's a highly regarded leader in the real estate technology communities and a frequent presenter and training instructor. Prior to KW, Carrie served as an Oracle consultant with database consultants, implementation manager for Copera, and a database architect at Dell. Finally, I get to introduce one of the industry's best kept secrets and today's mod moderator, Tracy Weir, founder of August Partners. <laughs> Tracy provides technology companies, MLS associations, and top tier brokers with strategy and communication counsel that help build their business. Formerly the chief marketing officer at Inman News, and Vice President of Marketing at California Closets, Tracy's champions, champions startups and growth companies providing new ideas, effective communications, and smart growth positioning. She's also an advisor and an, an investor in several real estate startups. Her past clients include Barclays Global Investors, Inman News, McGuire Real Estate, My Florida Regional MLS, Oracle Pacific Union, and Remax. When she's not busy helping clients plan for the future or build brand strategies, she can be found on stages across our nation sharing her knowledge and insights into the virtues of differentiation, technology, content marketing, social media, and customer engagement. Welcome, Tracy. The panel is yours. Wow. Thank you so much, Aaron. So great to be here. My job today is the fun one. I get to guide the conversation and to elicit opinions about things that matter. So I'm going to dive right in. Um, and ask the panel the hardest question of all. Um, so let's just start in on the hard stuff. What is the brokerage's value proposition in the 21st century? And I bet it's different because each of you has a different business model. So let's start with you, Carrie. What, what is it that brings the value proposition of the brokerage to the 21st century? So really, it actually hasn't changed a huge amount. The medium and the methods that we achieve that goal um, have changed. Um, but really, providing that great value is providing education, um, providing a platform where you can be an entrepreneur and build a business. Um, that's what, what our value proposition is, is how do you build a big, strong business that is yours? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's why most people get into real estate, is to build a business. So are we providing the education? Are we providing the tools um, to help you be more efficient um, in your time, in your space? Are you connecting with the right people at the right time in the right space? Um, so. And then third is a culture. Um, do I have a group that I work with, that I connect with, um, that really helps me build that business um, that I'm looking to build? And so when we look at it, it still goes back to those core fundamental tenets of do I have an education? 
Do I have great tools to help me build my business? And do I have a culture with a group that helps me in growing my business and helps me be a part of who I am? So let me ask you, Russ, mm -hmm. do you think that fits between the, in the value proposition between buyer and seller and, and agent? How does that actually in practice work? Help, help me um, so a bit more context there. In, in terms of uh, what Carrie just said, mm -hmm. in terms of providing education, building a culture, mm -hmm. providing value, how does that in practice work today between buyers and sellers and agents? Like how does that translate into the, into the people working in the field? So uh, our perspective is, is similar to mm -hmm. Carrie's in that um, at the end of the day, uh, we look at how we help um, our agents learn how we help our agents sell more, how we agents how we help our agents earn more, because selling, you know, in a business context, generating mm -hmm. revenue and actually earning money could be two different things. Um, and how we help them be owners of their business. And when you build that sort of ecosystem, um, and you're helping them being really competent at what they're there to craft, right? So they're learning. Um, you give them the tools to be able to sell and cultivate clients because we all know that um, it's, it's a market share game, right? Um, I believe that, quite frankly, there are too many real estate licensees in the country um, chasing too few deals. Not that you're controversial at all, Russ. Yes. Yeah. Not um, at all. No. Um, and, say what and, you think, please. And, and so I, I think what happens is that um, uh, you have uh, a, a lack of, of deals out there. So uh, the ability for the brokerage company to help um, them capture buyers and sellers is huge. Uh, be able to close those transactions efficiently, effectively, helping consumers, buyers and sellers, and then um, sharing in the ownership elements of that. And that's something that we, we think is extremely important and is part of our core uh, value proposition. Now, each of you has a different business model, and of course, Redfin's agents are all employees. So, Glenn, if uh, these guys are saying it's all about education, culture, training, how does that apply when you have all employees as agents? Well, I think we have a different relationship with our agents because all of us are employees, all of us get health care, all of us have a salary, and then we earn our pay just by delivering good service. But my idea of what a brokerage should do is it should just help you meet more customers. If where you work doesn't help you meet more customers, I'm not sure why you work there as an agent. And so that's what the brokerage of the future has to do, is help you meet more customers. It has to mean something whether you work for Keller Williams or another brokerage, uh, a Redfin or something else. People have to want to work with you because of where you are uh, at your brokerage. And I think that's the challenge for each of us to stand for something different in the consumer's mind. So the customer's making a choice to work with the agent, but also to work with the brokerage. And if we don't have that affiliation, if the consumer doesn't care where the agent works, then the agent should work where the split is the best. And my argument is that brokerages are really differentiating themselves, and they really stand for something, and it means something to the consumer, and that's how we earn our pay. Our other challenge is just to be small. Um, you know, there's so many folks with their hands in real estate agents' pockets. And Redfin's challenge now is just to be as efficient as we can possibly be. Where everyone sweeps the floors, where even though we have engineers um, whom we have to pay and we have marketing budgets uh, that we have to fund, uh, we have to be just absolutely <coughs> like rabid squirrels about being efficient because it's all paid for by the sweat of a real estate agent's brow. That's a saying at Redfin. And I think that's something that the industry's been really good about, which is trying to respect uh, the money that agents give us um, when, when uh, they either work for us as employees or um, work for us as contractors. So that's a really interesting, um, interesting point. And all three of you so far are national, but now we're going to go super local. Mm -hmm. So Jonathan, how do you think that applies to you? I mean, really respecting the agent. How do you compete against these big brands? So that's a really good question. I think. Oh yeah, yeah. Sorry, I should have. There we go. Is it on now? There we go. <laughs> We can hear you um, now. <laughs> so I, I think that um, 
there are two different value propositions, and, and you sort of elaborated on it earlier. There's either the uh, value proposition of um, allowing an agent to keep more of their earnings and keep more of what they make, um, and that generally goes along with providing less services, less marketing, less tools, less support staff, fewer offices, fewer facilities, things like that, because there simply isn't as much to, to pay for that um, in that type of business model. And we're kind of on the other side of that coin where um, we try to attract agents who are really more focused on the top line and what they could achieve if they could sell more, uh, um, what, the, what the upside potential is instead of really focus on the bottom line. And when we focus on the upside potential, it's really on helping agents meet more customers, helping them find more customers that are already in their database or that know people in their database. And, and I think when brokers really focus on that aspect of an agent's business and how to help an agent um, get to know more people in the community, get to, um, and, and then also provide a um, well-respected brand that is a backstop for the agent. So when they do walk into a presentation the first time they meet a client that, that they know that that agent's with some, with a company that's respected um, and a company that, you know, is, is doing good things in the community. And as a local business, we have to strive extra hard to do that because we don't have that um, national brand behind us. We have to establish a local brand. And, and it, it takes a lot of time and, quite frankly, it takes a lot of money and energy to do it. Okay, so here's a question for each of you. You get one answer each in rapid fire round. Who are brokerages competing against? Carrie, one answer. Russ, one answer. So forth. And then we're going to debate it. Who are brokerages competing against? That's a new entity. So is it Zillow? Is it new entrants? Is it paper brokerages? Who is it that brokerages are really competing against at the at, at scale? At scale? Who? So for the consumer mindset? Sure. It could be consumer mindset. It could be one one against the other. Who do you think brokerages are competing against themselves? Well, obviously, I mean, we we folks said it from a from a recruiting standpoint. So we're competing against each other every single day okay. in everything that we do. And are we providing that value to to have a big enough vision? I think all of us consistently have said we're all about how we help people right. grow their businesses okay. bigger. And so, are we competing? Do we have a big enough vision? that's bigger, that, that can grow and be bigger so that people who are working within our organizations can actually have big visions and achieve those goals. So we're, we're competing with each other okay. uh, every single day on, on growing and building our business. Okay, Russ, what about you? Uh, agree. I mean, the zero, real estate is a zero-sum game, um, and it's, it's a market share game. So nothing, as much as we want to think that we're all powerful and helping people choose to buy and sell homes, that is a macroeconomics uh, uh, equation. Um, things like interest rates and uh, 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 consumer confidence and uh, governmental issues affect how many homes can be bought and sold in a given year. We service that as an industry. And so as a brokerage company, it's about market share. Uh, if we can take a, a good productive agent from a Keller Williams or a Redfin or a Realty Austin, that's market share for us, and we, we do better that way. If we lose a good productive agent to a Keller or Redfin or a Realty Austin, we lose market share. So, um, so I agree. I also think that there is competition from um, the, the portals. Uh, at the end of the day, um, the portal wars are just starting. People think that, they're, um, that they've been around for 10 years, and so they're, they're here and, and they're part of our life. It, it's not. Um, uh, if you're following what, what Realtor and Zillow are doing, um, they've focused on the buy side um, lead generation. Now they're very much focusing on the sell side lead generation. Um, th that whole issue is just beginning. And to the extent that um, they're able to uh, control lead generation, any significant piece of it, that's a huge issue for all brokers sitting at, at this table and then across the country. Mm -hmm. Glenn, what about you? I agree that brokers compete with one another, but I think agents will go to the place where the brokerage where there is a consumer preference. So I think we're competing for the consumer, not for the agent. You know, we've never had a hard time recruiting agents when we've had customers who have wanted to work with us. And I just worry about the industry being only focused on agent recruitment and not also focus on customer recruitment. Um, I, I also would just say that when we think about the portals, duking it out with each other, I just think it's really important for brokerages to have a web presence. Every brokerage should yeah. have a web presence. 
I know that there's kayak in the travel industry where some people start their search, but American Airlines also has a website, and if it didn't, uh, it would make far less money. So I do think we have to be the source for people to find out information about what's going on in the local real estate market, and if we don't do that, we'll lose control of, of the customer and then lose control of our future. Um, I, I'd agree. We, we spend our time, uh, especially with my marketing team, really on two different pads all the time. We're talking about uh, strategies to recruit agents, and we're talking about strategies to generate leads. And uh, you have to do both really well all the time. And to generate leads, you have to have a strong web presence. Um, you, you just have to invest in it. And now it's not just a web presence. It's a mobile app presence. And it's social media marketing and um, remarketing, retargeting, display advertising, on and on and on and on. Because of the portals, we've had to get more, spend more, and um, come up with new ideas, come up with new campaigns to generate online business because they, they suck the, uh, the volume out of the search engine friendly terms to the point where it's more and more difficult to compete with national websites to get traffic to your own. So that's a, that's a question. How do you compete in that environment? Well, then and I'll just add one thing onto that. When we look at the, the competition of, of what someone like a, a Zillow is doing to us, we watch, and we watch all the numbers. If you look at the number of FISBOs, has actually dropped um, since portals have come on the market. I think sometimes you release a lot of information, and you think it's a great thing, and people are going to go do their own business, and instead it's scary as as hell, excuse me. I offended. I'm like, I don't know how to stop that word. Um, but it's scary for the consumer who's looking, going, oh my gosh, there's all this information. Um, and so that's why we've seen FISBOs actually start to drop. Um, what we've seen is across the board, um, the online portals and the leads that come out of there, do you, someone take a guess. What do you think the ROI is across the board? Someone throw out a number. What do you think it is? How much? Uh huh. 50%. 50%. How about negative 32%? Oh, geez. Negative 32% ROI from online lead generation in that mess. There's 5 million properties that are sold a year. It doesn't matter if they generate 50 million views every single day. There's still 5 million properties that are being sold. And so you're looking at diminishing returns, which is why we focus on how do we make it so that that local connection, it is a local business. It's a very local business between an agent and their clients. So how do we make it so that those agents are meeting those needs of those clients? And really establishing that local connection. Um, because at the, at the end of the day, so someone's going to dream on another search, negative 32% ROI, we're going to make sure and focus on how we make a great real estate experience between an agent and their client. So. Go ahead. Yeah, I think um, one thing that is sort of under the surface in this discussion is the, is the importance of, um, of, of brand and, and where that brand lives. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, from our standpoint, the brand lives with the agent. Uh, we, we are here to support the agent and their business and their local brand. And, and there are brokerage companies that um, like to talk about the importance of their brand and not that not that the brokerage company's brand is completely insignificant, but um, I mean, if I, for the agents, I know we have some brokers here, but for the agent, they have a little audience participation. If, if you had to rate the importance of and the value of your personal brand in your sphere of influence compared to the brand of your broker, raise your hand if you think your brand is more important. Right? Mm. That's, that's the customer talking. That was about 50% of the room that said their own brand is more important than the customer. Right. Or than the, the broker, rather. Than the broker. That, and so, so we, lit, we go, okay, well, the customer is telling us that their brand is more important. And quite frankly, whether it is or isn't is kind of an academic question because it doesn't matter. You think it is, and, and we tend to agree with that. And I think the mm -hmm. studies support that, that when it comes time to um, sit in the kitchen table with that buyer or seller, it's about the person sitting across from them, not the color on their card. And from our standpoint, to the extent that we can support that and helping them maintain those relationships, and going back to the portal scenario, if you think about it, the portals monetize the fact that the industry is really, really bad at maintaining their relationships with past customers. If you, the math is striking. If, if this industry could do a better job in maintaining its relationship with people that have bought and sold homes with an individual agent, 
uh, not a company, but an agent, right? right. Um, the portals wouldn't have a business. So our pers perspective is is clearly support the brand and help agents maintain that relationship over time for their business. But do you think that customers can really tell? I mean, if, if it is true that the agent's brand is super important to the customer, can the customer tell what the brokerage's brand is in the context of that? Is that important? The question is, is it important? Yeah, is it important? Well, the no, question is what the brand is. stands for. If mm -hmm. it's just an empty marketing vessel because we've run a TV ad or a billboard, then it doesn't matter what the color of your card is. But if the brokerage where you work allows you to get people into homes faster and build the Uber of real estate, or if it lets you track your customer's search online so you know what they like and you can comment on it and help them during that search. I mean, I think there are capabilities that a brokerage can deliver because if the color of your card doesn't matter, you really should go to the place with the lowest split. And then the brokerage just disappears. I think there is a place for a brokerage to help its agents deliver better service to the customer that is meaningful to that customer. And then if you are able to do that and able to retain your agents at a higher rate than the industry average, which isn't that hard to do, you've got a great business because you're going to help agents meet customers, you're going to be able to retain the agents and then have those relationships over the life cycle of several sales. So I just think that when we talk about brand, if it's just the color of the card, then absolutely an agent should go work wherever the split is the best. But I think when the brokerage really stands for something for the consumer, that will help you meet more of those customers. And then for the agent, that will help you build a better culture. And just look at the average age of real estate agents. I think it's 57 years old. But when you try to recruit new blood into this industry, what people want is a sense of mission, a sense of culture, a sense of purpose, a sense of teamwork. And I see local brokerages really delivering on that. You know, as, as much share as we sometimes try to gain from larger brokerages, the toughest competitors are sometimes the local guys because they've built something really real and meaningful in their community. And I think the challenge for us as national brokers is to do the same. So, so we're a little different in that we really believe that while the agents, I 100% I, I agree that when in, you sit down at the kitchen table, that that relationship between the consumer and the agent, and whether they like each other, know each other, respect one another, whatever, is what helps the agent primarily win the business. But we believe also that the agent doesn't need to go out and establish their own logo and their own colors and their own signs and their own brochures and their own magazine ads with all their own branding in order to stay forefront of that consumer's mind. In fact, I think in 99% of the cases, it actually works against the agent's best interest because it takes thousands and thousands of dollars to establish a brand with enough impressions that a consumer can even remember. What I hear all the time from our agents in, in markets where we have strong market share is that their sellers are driving around seeing our signs everywhere, which are all the same with different names on them and different phone numbers on them. And, but they know that Mary works at Realty Austin, so they know that when they see Realty Austin sign, whether it's Mary's or not, they're thinking of Mary, and they're going to call Mary. So it's that overall impression that you're able to get, I think, by keeping um, some control over the aspects of your brand as a brokerage. And, and if you're um, you know, starting out and starting to establish a brand as a brokerage, I think you need to think hard about whether you really want to let your uh, realtors go out and establish their own and their own identities because it does work against your brand and it works against their best interest too most of the time. Not so, always. So if that's time. the case, then what sort of package of services do agents actually value when it comes to their broker? Like, is it a strong web presence? And what other elements do agents actually value coming from the broker? Uh, I mean, it's the whole package. It, it, it starts with culture and cohesiveness and them feeling like they're part of a, of a collaborative team. It start, the support staff that's there to answer their questions in a cheerful manner that is there to help them all the time. Um, in some cases, good facilities, maybe near their home or a place where they work. It could be the differentiator. Um, it could be providing them with more opportunities in the form of you know, referrals from your, your um, relocation networks or website leads, marketing, um, automation, tools, CRM, website alerts, mobile apps, 
So that actually leads me to a very interesting question. A lot of agents feel extraordinarily protective of their data. It's their client, mm -hmm. it's their contact information, it's their CRM, and they don't want the broker to have it. Anyone ever heard that before, <laughs> once or twice? So how do you deal with it? How do you get people over the hump to trust you as the broker to share that information so you can provide that great package of services? We bring a meal to the potluck. You have to, as a broker, <laughs> generate customers for your agents. If the agents are the only ones generating customers and then you're asking them to put that in the database, it's sort of hard because you're not adding anything. So our goal is to try to generate customer contacts for our agents. And then I think the other side of this is that we are really struggling with work-life balance issues because customers want to tour homes 24-7. It's an on-demand, last-second economy. And the way that we've addressed that is by building a team to support each agent. And the only way that team works is if the agent shares customer information with the team. So if you're at your son's baseball game and somebody wants to see a house on Saturday afternoon or Friday night and you're not available, well, if you haven't put that customer in a database that the rest of the team can access, no one's going to be able to help you. And I think a lot of agents feel that loneliness where they have to answer always at every moment and they do that for a year or two years or three years but it really wears you down if you can't get support so collaboration and data sharing kind of go hand in hand and it's the only way that we've had to meet the demands of some of these younger customers who really expect everything right now I had a I saw on a Facebook post uh, by a very successful agent up in the Northwest um, this line that just sticks with me um, on this same issue and uh, I totally agree with what Glenn said. You have to deliver some beef to the equation, right? You have to you have to give something back when you're asking for it. But the quote was, um, in the terms of the question in this Facebook chain was, uh, um, do you use your broker's technology or do you, do you use third-party technology? And and this agent, very successful agent, uh, very, um, you know, not quite millennial, a little bit older than millennial, but um, very into technology. She said, why would I build my house on rented land? <laughs> and that has always struck with me. Why would I build my house on rented land? And I think that's the mentality that a lot of agents view their broker relationship. It's it's, it's transactional in nature. It's transitory until a better deal comes in. And so the way we've tried to deal with it, clearly we've got to deliver um, something right. in return. But we also, um, we believe in, in co-ownership. So our, our, our perspective is that it's not rented land. It's partnered land. Right. We, we all own the thing, the, our brokerage company. And so, so it's, it's not about a us versus them. It's, a, it's, a tra it's, it's not about transaction. It's about what are we going to do together. And I think part of that is sort of the culture. Um, it, there is sort of this, this objective value, but there's also this kind of touchy-feely element that, that goes along with it, supports this ability says, I trust you with what you right. have because we, we are partners in this versus I'm just renting land. Well, and now I would have a, a slightly different perspective. Um, trying to get folks to use a, a CRM and as we say, your database is your business. That is an agent's business. And so that's why you have the fear of, I'm not going to put it in there because when I leave your company, who is going to be marketing to that person that I have the relationship with? And it's going to be you as a broker. That's what's going through the mindset. And that happens. And that's a, that's a business model. Um, I would take a different perspective and say, we make a promise. And so when it comes to data sharing and, and how to get that belief is that we have a culture and it's a very trustworthy within our network um, that we make a promise and we stick by that promise. So launching a CRM, we said we believe our business model is that it's your business. We're all about building businesses worth owning and that's not our business, it's your business. So we made a promise that you leave the, the company, you take that with you, we never market to your clients. Those are your relationships. Can we build you better tools because we have that, have that information so we can provide more intelligent tools to help you do your business today better? Absolutely. That's what we're able to provide in return. But we made a promise about that agent's business, and we stick to that promise at all costs. And we have, you know, we'll have, I have lots of folks who can come in and say, oh, can't I just get this? And if I could just, and I'm like, no, absolutely not. We made a promise to our agents that it's their business, and they get to take that business with them, and we'll never mark market to that business because it's their relationship. So if you're going to make a promise, stick to it. That's how you build the trust. 
where someone says, let me have, I will give you all of my information because I now trust you. Um, it's, I was just in Disney World last week, um, for a week I'm still exhausted. Um, but great <laughs> trip to Disney World and we were talking about, if, has anyone been there recently with the magic bands? Yeah. So you wear these magic bands. We drive up to our hotel and it texts me our room number and I walk straight to the room, never have to check in, gets me in and out of the parks, I charge everything. Um, at the end of the day, <laughs> it was a big bill. Um, but we get to do everything. Everything's on that magic band. And the reason why, and I know that Disney World and Walt Disney Corporation is getting every bit of information. They know more about me than I know about myself. And I don't care because they have given me such value. And they also made a promise that they wouldn't sell that information. They wouldn't give it to anybody else. They wouldn't use it in a, any other way than to make my experience better. So I'm perfectly willing giving that information. So take the same mindset with, with your agents. That's the way that we've done it. Okay, but now, Jonathan, I have a question for you. Okay. This all sounds mighty expensive to me. <laughs> and, uh, you know, brokerages don't operate with incredibly deep pockets and vats of cash everywhere. So how do you actually do that? How do you build a culture? How do you, how do you build the marketing program? How do you actually budget for that? Do you focus on the top line or the bottom line? Um, well, it, it starts with, uh, well, it, it's, I think it starts with having the right compensation plan in place for the budget that you're trying to put out there. You have to figure out how much you're going to spend per agent. You need to know, it's, they used to call it your, your um, desk fee or you know, what it costs to mm -hmm. run each desk, and the desks are pretty virtual now, but you really need to know, you know when you take the amount of money you're going to spend in your budget and divide by the number of agents you have, you need to understand at the end of the day, what is it going to take in return from those agents to be able to pay for that? And it starts with really understanding that. But um, and, and there's so many different models that you can approach this from, and, and all different models sitting here at this table um, for how how to approach it. But it does. You have to you have to sit down and uh, really understand that value proposition. And as you're getting started, it does evolve. It changes. It's not going to be the same forever. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the fees that you have to charge um, go up and sometimes they go down. And it's uh, dependent on the market and recruiting and what new tools you have to provide and whether the tools cost more or less than they did before. So it's a moving target. You always have to pay attention to it. A lot of people feel like it's a race to the bottom in terms of the split. So how do you justify having a better split for the broker um, and justify having a desk fee so, so that the agent feels value in working for the brokerage? Um, you help your agents grow their business year over year and they're fo help them focus on the top line through business planning tools and uh, help them get new customers in their car or new, list, new signs in yards and they don't worry so much about that. Um, we also give them, as they produce more and as they move up the ladder, they do get better splits. So it uh, gives them extra incentive to sell more. But I think that's really fundamentally where it's at. Glenn, is it the same for you? Because you're, all of your agents are employees. So obviously they're not on splits. So mm -hmm. does the same sort of motivation work for you? Well, we have to make people wealthy, um, <laughs> just like anyone else. I mean, if you're a real estate agent at Redfin and you've worked with 100 clients whom we've introduced you to, you can walk out the door and take those clients with you in part. Some of them will stay. Some of them will go with you. So. We have to build a culture where people want to stay, but we also have to make sure that folks are well paid and that they can earn hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. Um, so that's our challenge. We haven't had a problem with attrition except in the first six months. There are some folks for whom real estate is a hobby and aren't used to as soon as you finish your apprenticeship. So that's where we see uh, the retention problems, but someone who has been at Redfin for a year is typically going to stay for five um, because they've uh, really been successful with our system and we want to make sure that person earns more every single year. I would just say though that that's only part of it. Part of it is having a really good life where you've got a team who supports you and part of it is having a good culture where you feel a connection. This idea that you're going to be the Lone Ranger uh, appeals to some folks who really want to build the business by themselves, but other folks 
need to feel like they belong to something that they're proud of and that they have connections with their colleagues. And that's something that every brokerage tries to build. And it's hard because you spend so much time in your car, you spend so much time with clients, you're not necessarily coming to the office every day. Uh, but that's just been a real focus for us. And for whatever reason, uh, we have had uh, low attrition. I think if you pay people well and they earn more each year, um, if you take care of them and their families and you build a culture um, that people really want to be a part of, uh, you're going to keep growing. But a big part of that is that more and more customers want to work with us every year. I think if we didn't deliver the customers to our agents, uh, it would be hard for their incomes to grow, it would be hard for their careers to grow in the way that they have at the company. So. Uh, we try to be different because there are folks who want that difference. I think there are other folks who don't. Right. Well, some of those folks who may not are lone wolf agents. Mm -hmm. So what's the, what's the promise and the threat of lone wolf agents, folks who just don't want to get a, be a part of a culture? I w I would, looking at lone wolf agents, is the growing, obviously you have different real estate cycles. When it's a hot market, you're going to have more solo agents. Um, I would worry about the economies of scale. Uh, we talked about our budgets. Mm -hmm. um, the technology budgets are going through the roof. You have no economies of scale. Mm -hmm. um, there is no backup. There is 100% um, life is serving those clients. Um, so I would be worried. Um, if you're thinking about going out to being a solo um, agent, we are seeing a little bit of a rise of that. Is that, is that the business that you're, that you're building? Um, do you have the infrastructure around you, the, the budget, the financial resources, um, the economies of scale to really grow your business, or have you set yourself up to a ceiling? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what happens when you don't want to work anymore? Right. I mean, <laughs> that's you know, a that, that, that's a problem. There's no succession in the context. There's no, there's no pathway to the future when either you choose or you can't or whatever it might be for you to decide I want to, you know, slow down or life gets in the way, uh, et cetera. And then, you know, we're, we're quickly, quickly moving to a very, uh, to business models that rely more and more on data. Um, there's a lot of people that, that talk about, you know, data analytics as if it, you can just buy it on a grocery shelf. Um, you can't. It's expensive. What's that? I ordered it on Amazon. You did you? Yeah. Did you get a Prime? Uh -huh. Okay, yeah. good. Um, <laughs> on Cyber Monday. There you go. Uh, <laughs> and, and so, um, pe pe lone wolf agents will have um, zero access to uh, the type of, of data-driven tools and, to Glenn's point, um, delivering more clients to the agent. Well, I think that's what we'll see. The, the rise of, we've seen such an explosion of teams. We've obviously been supporting teams for 30 plus years. Um, but that's why you see the rise of teams, of realizing that, well, I've, there's a ceiling. So how can I build a team around me to help grow, grow that business? Um, and how can I offset um, some of the other responsibilities and actually take the economies of scale um, of a larger organization where I can build a business within it um, so that I can have a strong business and have that infrastructure, have that support, um, but I'm building my own business. That's, I think, why we've seen the rise of teams. Can I speak to what I see as the elephant in the room? Yeah. I really want to encourage brokers to build websites. I know I've sounded that horn before, but for a while we were careful about this secret, which is that we added all these features to our website and to our mobile apps that did not matter. The feature that matters is just showing pictures of homes for sale and getting them on your site as quickly as possible. And if you are the listing agent being recognized as such and having other websites linked to you makes an enormous difference. If you look at the traffic that is going to the portals now, we do not aspire to be number one. We understand that they've built a brand and people are going to those sites, but traffic to some of the portals is declining year over year. Um, if you look at the fastest growing real estate websites, they are run by brokerages. Mm -hmm. And the reason the brokerages are getting the traffic is they have the inventory first. And when they share that inventory with other websites, they ask to be recognized, not just with a tiny little listing agent name somewhere on the site, but with the way recognition happens on the internet with the link. And when you do that, good things happen. <laughs> when you get more traffic to your website, even if it's just a site that's hosting your own listings, people can contact you directly. And the return on investment for that is literally infinite. If you did not pay 
an incremental cost to meet that customer and that customer is contacting you directly that is business that is good for any real estate agent for so any broker. I, I couldn't agree more but yeah. I'm also going to put you on the spot sure Redfin has invested millions tens of millions hundred million mm -hmm. I'm not many millions many many millions we in have. building a phenomenal search experience and I can tell you this because when I moved to Portland Redfin was my my oh. search portal I thought it was phenomenal I'm glad you used it but the problem is is that for brokerages an individual yeah. brokerage like let's say oh one sitting just immediately to your left yeah investing hundreds of millions of dollars in a website may not actually be feasible to build that that search experience so the question is is how much should you invest in your site let's presume that everyone agrees we should all have a website everyone have a website but, but let, me, let me just try to answer that question so first of all um, we have not invested hundreds of millions of dollars in our search site um, we have blown a lot of capital trying to make our retail model work which just means that sometimes we've sold a home and paid an agent more than we got from the customer um, that was hard uh, we've built a lot of technology on the back end to, to make the escrow process go more easily. Um, and then we've wasted some money on features for the consumer, for the search site, mm -hmm. that don't matter. What I'm telling you, the dirty secret, and it really has worked for us, is that if you put listings on a website and you get people to link to you as the listing agent, you will get traffic. That doesn't cost that much money. There are other things that cost money. I think the fact that mobile is now forcing us to build applications for iPhone and Android has really made the cost of competing uh, on a technology front harder. But I will also tell you that most of our resources on mobile are going to mobile web and not the apps. The apps were much more important three years ago. Uh, Google has kind of beat Apple, and Google much prefers web. mobile web. Yep over applications. It likes stuff in HTML that it can index in a search engine. It is punitive toward applications. It wants a good mobile website experience that it can access from the search. So long story short, I think there are some things that have made it more expensive. There's a lot of investments that we've made that haven't paid off. But if I were a broker, I would just try to get my listings on a website and then I would make sure to get credit for the listings from the portals, from the brokers, from Redfin, from everyone. I think that is the simplest thing you can do. I think it's the simplest thing the MLSs could do to give agents a better deal, is to make sure you always get credit for your listings in the modern digital way. And, and I mean, it's a, I think when you talk about whether you should have a web presence for consumers, it's not a, an or conversation. Well, Austin Board of Realtors has one, or I'm going to have one, or Redfin's going to have It's an and conversation. Um, it's we're all going to and there is great competition in that and that actually really helps when we talk about how do you make sure you've got that leverage and how do I make sure that someone else doesn't change how the real estate transaction is done um, is by providing more competition providing more of that local expertise now we may invest more in making sure that that local agent website but there's 5,000 agent websites here that can actually draw that and show that expertise um, of what that local expert does and then take it on a regional and a national scale um, but it's not a I'm always I'm either going to use this one or I'm going to use that one um, I, it's a it's a, if but we, we can all say that it's obvious but we're not doing the one obvious thing which is getting credit for our listing data through a link if we did that there would be far more traffic to brokerage sites and so maybe I just jumped out of a time machine and I'm talking about building a website when that was obvious 25 years ago but the one part of that that I just really want to emphasize is if I were a broker, I'd make sure I got credit for my listings. It's so very it's rare on the internet. Yeah, so yeah, Jonathan, what do you think? On a couple, a couple of points. Um, the first is on the everybody should have a website concept, which it, every, fundamental, brokerage. every broker it should have a mm -hmm. website. I agree with that for 100% that a broker, if a broker doesn't have a strong web presence, they're going to be left behind very soon, if not already. Um, where I still caution is the concept that every agent should should focus on building a website because um, I know of a local broker here in town who spent years and all their energy helping agents become webmasters and build their own websites and become bloggers and build IDX search engines and none of the sites generated real business for the agents but meanwhile all their agents took their eye off the ball and sold less in real estate than the A-bar average. So, 
you, and they had over 100 agents. And this ha you have to be very careful not to focus all your energy as a real estate agent on becoming a webmaster if that's not your forte. Um, you need to hire someone to do it if you want to do that. Um, hire someone to help you. Don't, don't spend all your time working on a website because before you know it, you won't have any customers. Mm -hmm. right. um, and the, as far as the sharing listings, the idea really of sharing, agree with that. Yeah, so yeah. the sharing listings idea, they, I, I think uh, what Glenn is talking about is the idea that the IDX listing sharing model um, should maybe include a, a rule that we share links back to each other's websites through that um, listing. And I, as a larger broker, I think it would help us a lot because we have so many listings. The smaller brokers, I don't know if it would help them as much as it would help us. Uh, it, would, it would create a lot of links back to our website, which would certainly be good. I don't know in the grand scheme of the, once that experiment plays out if it's going to help or hurt the small brokers or help everybody equally. It it's, hasn't been done. It's a lot of websites <laughs> linking to each other that would be interesting. It will help large brokers more than small brokers. It would help you against Redfin since yeah, you have significantly yeah. more listing share than we do. Um, but I think what it would begin to do is tell the rest of the internet that the best place to go for information about the listing is to the site of the yeah. agent of who the took the photos and wrote the description mm -hmm. and walked through the house. Yeah. And by that I mean the brokerage site. I thought the distinction yeah. between yeah. agents and brokers was important. Okay. Russ, what do you think, well, having well, been on every side of this issue? Yeah, so um, I, again, I think that um, the, the portals have a have a say in this. Um, they're not going to roll over, and 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 I know the Realtor.com provides links. Um, Zillow at at times does, uh, and it it doesn't. It's not supportive of their business model, and the challenge we have is is um, they want that traffic, uh, and the question is how do you make them give it up? And um, that's been going on for years now, and mm -hmm. and it's it's. I don't think the industry is saying we're going to do this is going to change it. I, I agree with you, Glenn. I agree with you. But it's I, hard to make. that deliver better and more leads to their agents and and this is the end and this is where the industry I think really you take a have a takeaway from things sessions like these 
um, is the industry is really bad, generally speaking, at responding and dealing with internet leads. It's, it's, it's the amount of, of the biggest problem, when I was at Realtor.com, the biggest problem we had was not delivering leads to people. It was the consumer experience when a lead went out and nobody responded. Right. It was incredible, mm -hmm. right? And, and so the, the, the challenge, I think, for, the, for most of the people sitting around the room is, is work with a brokerage company that's going to give you leads because <clears throat> we can give our agents lots of leads. And I'm sure you can, I'm sure you do, and I'm sure you do as well, right? So find those brokers that can give you lots of leads and then work with a brokerage company that's going to help you monetize those leads in a way mm -hmm. that, that, that actually takes them from... Um, because an internet lead is, is far different than a lead that you get because you met somebody at your church function or um, in, in your kid's baseball game or at work or what it's, it's a different deal and and the industry doesn't hasn't yet really figured that out at, at scale um, and the the company and the agents that get that um, are going to have a, um, a success rate in closing transactions far above the norm no, and, and there's a question to add on. Oh. I just I disagree with that I spent tens of thousands of dollars on Zillow, you name it. Majority of my leads come in between 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. Uh, very difficult to get to those. I know they're going out to multiple agents. It's not that the customers, it's on the agent side, if you've called five in a row and you're spending, I don't know, let's say $1,500 a month, you've called five in a row and they've all been bumped, nobody returns your calls, they've already got somebody, Real quickly, you decide to stop answering those. So it's it's kind of a it's a customer experience, but it's also a you know an agent slash broker experience that experience that you know we just don't see the value in those. So I get called five times a week from Trulia, Zillow, you name it, especially the new agents. You know they just prey on new agents. And I have a perspective on that. I, I think part of the challenge that you're running into now is that you're not only competing with other agents for those leads, you're competing with call centers set up by brokerages who have people working around the clock who are calling and texting those leads repeatedly, immediately, regardless of when they inquire. So if you're not going to stay awake or pay someone to stay awake all night and do that, uh, you know, skip going to the movies, skip going out with your clients, and, and always be immediately responsive to those leads that are shared with multiple agents, you won't succeed anymore. Can I add to that? Yeah. Uh, it was a real challenge for us, not because we were buying leads from other websites, but because we were meeting customers through our own. And it's different for us. It's, it's all our problem. You know, if we send bad customers to our agents, uh, there are employees. It's not the agent's problem, it's the company's problem. So we've had to make many changes to our website to reduce the amount of customers who are contacting us because there's some channels we would open where we'd declare an immediate success and then our agents would say, none of these people are serious buyers. Mm -hmm. And then there are other things we've done where we started asking questions before people could sign up for a tour to make sure they weren't working with another agent that drastically reduce the volume, but actually increase the throughput of, uh, of closings. Um, so it's kind of nice that there's one throat to choke, but the other big change um, has just been around this call center thing where we have licensed folks who do evening shifts now because originally we hooked up top producing agents who are hosting tours with million dollar clients to our website where their phone number was on our website on a lot of pages of our site and you could contact them directly. It was a bad agent experience. Their phone was blowing up all night. It was a bad customer experience because the customer wasn't getting the response he wanted. And we really went through hell on this because we weren't sure that a call center was so great either. How local will that person be? How invested will that person be? How many handoffs will there be? How many different Redfin folks will I talk to uh, before I end up buying this house. And I don't think we've figured it out. I don't think the industry has figured it out. Um, we've got an internet that's running 24 seven and human beings who can't. Um, and we're just trying to figure out how to give the client what he wants. And that's what I, would, I would say that the biggest change that, that we've seen because of that exact issue um, mm -hmm. is the rise as people are growing their, their businesses is one of the key hires that's being hired is um, someone who is that call 
coordinator um, as they're coming in they're vetting those and so then they're handing off warm leads um, to the agents who are building those relationships um, we do a lot of behavioral profiling and it's a very different behavioral skill set so you're trying to get someone who's in great at the table in relationships that's also taking 50 calls a day trying to vet which ones are valid which ones aren't and so it's really the rise of, of a new person that's on those team structures that's really that that gate people that are better who's actually helping to hand off I'm so enthusiastic about this topic we think about it a lot too like we've had people who move from a deal writing agent a, a person who's out in the field who's the top earner at the company that's the top earning role at the company we've had people who say that is too intense it's too much stress it's too much work and they come back to a role where it's kind of nine to five or whatever the shift may be I'm I'm working on a team and supporting another agent and they've actually been happier and we've had people kind of go through life changes where the kids went off to college and actually now they're ready to go back out into the field again and, and really have a different job but it's been super, super hard and interesting for us to figure out how to put people into different roles. But when I talk to traditional agents, you know, I think once you're starting to do around 30 deals a year, if you're doing more than that, you need to have someone who never leaves the office. And that's, that's, that's a, uh, an issue with this Lone Ranger um, mm -hmm. uh, agent because they're trying to do all things, be all things to all people. And I think um, the demands of consumers these days is looking for specialization, even at the agent level. And so the idea that of the agent in the past that did, did everything, right, um, from right. soup to nuts is going away and we're seeing the creation of, you know, it's the team, it's a team construct, right? Um, you have a team leader and then you have buyer's agents and you have call center people and those and and the brokerage companies that can facilitate that and service that and support that concept not in because that used to be the brokerage function I mean that used to be the brokerage tried to do everything and and actually support that team structure I think teams um, not to say that they're not the present but they are the future of this industry uh, because uh, that I think you see uh, a lot of ability for people like yourself to uh, to build groups within brokerage companies and again build brand that doesn't exist at the brokerage level. I think we have a question over there. Yeah, my name is George Banks. I've been a member of AOR for 12 years. Thanks so much for coming. You guys have mentioned a lot about the competition between Zillow and the portals and the customer retention. And also competition between, you know, our community as, as agents and we're competing against each other. What would your advice be to your agents on client loyalty? Is that something that's dead? Is that something that you can create? Um, how do you So I'm just, I'm going to repeat the question for folks who might be watching this on the stream. The question was, how do you create client loyalty in the age of Zillow or other portals? So uh, I'll, I'll start with that one as well. And it's a, it's a very important topic. I mean, something to really look at because if you look at buyers, 55% of home buyers came through a referral. 65% of sellers came through a referral or past business. And so it's still, it's a significant portion of your business. So two key things, one is, are you staying in contact? Um, I know you're providing something of value. It's not sending recipe cards, but are you actually reaching out? Are you very purposefully reaching out multiple times a year to stay in contact with those people and ask for referrals from them? You know, do you know anybody else? They might not be buying. It's what now average of 12 years I saw um, yesterday up from seven when people are moving. So are you keeping in contact regularly? And I'm not talking just sending out emails. That's not enough. It's do you have it on where you pick up the phone and call them every six months and say hello, find out how they're doing. What can you do to help them? Are you incorporating social media into how you're staying in contact so that they remember that you are an agent? Um, so that's number one. Number two is a, is a new concept that we're really seeing with our, with our top teams that is going extremely well, and you see it in the software industry today, um, and that's the concept of membership. So are you providing something so your customers, because they've worked with you um, as an agent, do they get access to other services that no one else gets? Are you helping them with their home ownership throughout the life cycle of when they're owning it, and not just sending them information about when to replace their furnace? Um, but are you actually providing them tools? They're going to have a party for their for their kiddo. They want to get bouncy houses. Do you have a service that you can actually help bring that in for them? Because they're part of your club. They've got a membership into your business. And so think about it as a membership type of mentality so that people aren't thinking about it as a one transaction, but a lifelong, how are you providing value to me? That's my advice. 
And I'd, I'd add on to that, um, it's a mindset shift. So I agree with everything Carrie just said. Um, the value for loyalty historically has not been provided, right? And so what you see is the statistics where at the closing table, the number of buyers and sellers who said they are very satisfied with their agent, would use them again, are in the 70, 80%. And yet the, um, the repeat business, they actually use that same agent some years down the road is about 20%. So something happens in that period of time that takes that person who says, I love my agent. I love, they're great, they closed my deal. And then a year or two or three passes and they can't even remember the company that they worked for. So, so it, but it's, it's also a mindset change and it also goes to what I said earlier, which is the typical agent doesn't have enough deals today let alone the deals that are gonna happen from customer loyalty mm -hmm. years down the road. Most agents are thinking on 90 day cycles of closings, right? How, what's, my, what's my deal flow? How do I close more deals in 90 days, right? They're not thinking a year or two or three out in the future. And I think another element of this team mentality is, is people around the loyalty aspect because the producers aren't thinking a year or five down the road. Right. Nor should they be, quite frankly. But if they don't, they don't have somebody on their team that's doing it, they can't expect loyalty because it won't happen. It hasn't happened and it won't happen in the future. And then the brokerage company has to provide tools and, and value that the agents can use to deliver those clients that actually means something to them. So I guess that's my question for Jonathan, is how much can you actually deliver as the broker to support this? You can deliver quite a bit if you have solid adoption of your CRM. You have to have everybody's clients in the database. And um, I agree with everything they said about getting the buy-in. We actually have it in writing that we won't keep their, keep their clients if they leave. But like we, we've had 100% adoption of our CRM since we rolled it out in 2005. It's a requirement that you put your clients in CRM to work at Realty Austin, but it's not something we have to twist people's arms to do because we, we have the numbers that show by putting your people in our system, you're going to have all these automated touches in print and email uh, coming next year um, as well on Facebook and Instagram. We'll be automating marketing for our agents to their client base, to their custom audiences. Um, we're putting our client, our agents in front of our clients t easily 24 times a year and that's without the agent doing anything extra to try to stay in front of them. If they do some things like set them up on a neighborhood search alert or, you know, um, send them uh, an extra postcard or do an annual review, um, you know, make a phone call once a quarter, which we can remind them to do. If they just do some simple things, um, they'll stay in what we call the flow with their clients. And, and we're a Ninja company. We rolled out Ninja this past year to about two thirds of our company and it'll hit the other third next year. And Ninja teaches realtors how to stay in the flow with the people that matter most so they can get more business out of their database. And Ninja was developed by Larry Kendall at the Group Inc. in Fort Collins, Colorado, where they have the highest number of transactions per agent in a 300 agent company in a small Fort Collins market year after year after year. They do something like 30 transactions per agent on average, which is pretty unheard of. So it's really teaching your agents how to stay in the flow with their clients, but also giving them the tools, and we do it through our CRM, to remind them to do it and help them categorize people and organize people. So You've got this volume of data. What can you do with it besides helping agents? I oh. mean, what can you do with predictive, predictive analytics, for example? Our, our goal for next year is to leverage big data with our database of about half a million contacts to identify who is most likely to list their home in the next year, who's most likely to move, to, to really start to pull that data together. And um, it's not readily available to go purchase, so it's something that you have to kind of delve into and figure out. But I think that is really ultimately where we want to start with it, but there's so much you can learn about your customers with big data now, it's just a matter of how much you're willing to spend to do it. Is it not cheap? That's my, that's my question is, is there are a number of purveyors out there saying that they can easily predict who's going to move and they're, they're happy to uh, put your hand in your pocket to help you do that. Yeah. But the question is, is, you know, what data actually matters? How do you actually make the choice to, to buy that data and make use of it? Can I just say that I think what he asked about is a much higher return on investment than that. We've mm -hmm. really worked hard to identify sellers before they sell and it just hasn't been a totally fruitful project for us. Uh, I did want to just share though what has worked on repeat business for us. The obvious things are of course 
knock their socks off with the service, keep your best agents incredibly happy, try to keep all your agents happy. But there have been a few emails that really work. Uh, getting people at tax time with everything they need is just an obvious one. The second one is um, when a, a home sells that validates their decision, where you're like, oh my gosh, look, this home isn't even as good as yours, and it's sold for more money. Uh, they like that. Um, but the weirdest one has been this extreme weather email. Um, we tried it in Denver first, and now we've rolled it out to all sorts of places. But when there was a big snowstorm in Denver, we emailed people who had just bought their first house and said, look, you don't have a super anymore. You don't have a landlord. Here are the things you need to do to, to protect your investment. Mm -hmm. So like if there's a big rainstorm in Austin and you can just send a note saying, hey, how's your, how'd your house hold up under that? Is everything okay? You should make sure your gutters are clear just so that you, know, you don't have water going down into the foundation or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And that has the highest response rate of any email we've ever sent. Um, and we send it from the agent. The agent sends it. He can personalize it. But if he doesn't personalize it, it just goes out. It doesn't work nearly as well if the agent doesn't personalize it. It doesn't work at all if it doesn't come from the agent's email address and it comes from redfin.com. Uh, but those have been the three where just a huge percentage of people respond and it starts a conversation. We're like, oh, you know, actually I'm back in the market or whatever it might be. Um, those have been the three that work the best. Interesting. So I think that's really interesting because on the one hand, you've got all this predictive data, the idea of lead generation. On the other hand, you have personal touch. So how, as a broker, do you decide where to invest, how much to put in personal touch and training, and then mm -hmm. investing in gathering these leads, trying to predict who's going to move? How do you do it? We, so, so when we look at this, we look at um, two different things. Um, one is when we're looking at the, the personal touch, we do go back to the basics. It's, are you lead generating? Are you reaching out to your contacts? Are you reaching out to the people that you know that may buy or sell for three hours every single day? Are you blocking your office door? Are you blocking all other calls? Are you staying focused on that? And so various different training methods and support systems throughout the offices to make sure, are you doing lead generation three hours every single day to grow your business? If you don't do that, it doesn't matter what technologies any one of us offer you, your business is not going to grow. Um, and so getting back to the basics of are you servicing those relationships every single day by reaching out very purposely in your, in your schedule. When we look at big data, now we're going to take our investment. We're making a, a large investment in, in big data, not in the traditional how can we identify. Can we take all the knowledge that we have so that when you are spending your three hours a day prospecting through your database, are we able to serve up and give you a better guide of who's the best people to reach out to today? What are some of the best scripts to talk with them today? What can, how can we help you make better use of this database? If you've got 500,000 people in your database, you cannot reach all of them every single day. If you do, you're a miracle person. Um, so how can we use big data to be able to actually make that a more intuitive experience? But then what I'm most excited about is when we look at the big data and what we can do with it, Fundamentally, when we look at search, for all the searches that are out there, including ours, search for a consumer is broken. Online search does not reflect the process that a consumer goes through with you as they try and figure out what house they want to buy. And so we're excited about using all the information that we have about people's behaviors that they'll never tell you. And that you can look at those key indicators and figure out how do we figure out that they actually want to be able to look at those photos and use artificial intelligence to only look at the kitchens because that's the most important thing. But when the husband logs in, it's only looking at the backyard because that's the most important thing to him. How can we be smarter about that in that search experience rather than a three bedroom, three bath, 78613 zip code search? I want to be, more, I want to be smarter about how to guide them through that process and excite people about the search. Wow, that's pretty futuristic. It's coming. <laughs> it's, it's coming sooner than you think, yeah. Very soon, actually. So but, how do you make that accessible? I mean, to, to the folks in this audience who are, who are thinking, that sounds pretty interesting. How do I make that work? For I me. just want to come back to your original question. <laughs> where there was some tension between how do you balance your time between prospecting for new clients and referrals. I think we have a higher volume of new clients than most other brokerages, and yet we're extremely opinionated that there is no new client that is worth more than a past mm -hmm. client. I mean, it's mm -hmm. just, you can measure it. It's not even close. Their close rates, their profits, their price point. Yep. It, you know, if, if, 
you, you need to get that base, but once you have that base, every mistake we've made has been not focusing enough on that base versus going after the new guy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if I could you know, teleport back and talk to my old self six or seven years ago, I, I would just talk to myself about that for a long time. And Glenn, do you see, do you see you, Glenn? <laughs> that would when be many other conversations. <laughs> when you teleported back, yeah. do you see a lot of when you start to, oh, all these t 50 different lead sources that I can get them, and you try and attack them all at once. Or then if you're uh -huh. going to try and draw in those new sources, find a new source, master it, systematize it, go to the next source. I don't know. What do you say? Well, our problem was that we focused on volume of new customer contacts instead of quality. Mm. Um, and it was coming from our own website. We didn't have any other sources. We couldn't afford any other source. And we just kept changing the site to drive more and more volume instead of more and more quality. Um, but then we also just had a situation where we weren't keeping in touch with the people we'd worked with. And now that's the fastest growing part of our business. It's the most profitable part of our business. I mean, I'm telling you things you already know, but I just worry that you know all this focus on meeting the next guy could make you forget about the first guy. And uh, the only reason I worry about it is because if you weren't dumb enough to make that mistake, I was. Um, and uh, I wish I hadn't. Yeah. We so actually, we actually started off with a different philosophy. My wife was in real estate before and was trained at Kelly Williams where they did a great job of teaching her how important it was to stay in touch with the people she already knows and to foster relationships with the people yeah, she already knows. Yeah. So we put systems in place for our agents to do that before we actually focused on the lead generation side of things and mm -hmm. still think it's easier clients to come by. Yeah. So I want to open it up to the floor for questions because we have some time here. And I'm wondering if anyone has a question for... There is one right there. So I'm just going to repeat the question. Um, how does a buyer leverage a linking strategy to bring a in new, new yeah. customers? I think it's harder. I mean, one reason that we focused more on listings recently at Redfin is because listers last. We really believe that's the basis of a, a good online strategy. It's also the basis of a good local marketing strategy. Um, I would just focus on sellers. And it's hard because they're harder to find. You know, it's not just the portals. Everyone, I think, has found that it's easier to meet buyers than it is to meet sellers. Yeah, and we, we find the same thing. Mm -hmm. Focus on your focus on listings. So the question is, how is the industry evolving uh, with respect to commission structures if you have employees or if you have commission-only salespeople? Well, I think the interesting thing about this panel is that we, you have four successful companies, but all doing it differently. So you have a, a, a national franchisor, you have a national brokerage company, independent contractor, more traditional, you have a national brokerage company, employee-based, and then you have a, a local more traditional company. So we all are looking at this in, in different ways. Um, I think the beauty of our industry is that there's never going to be one model that is truly the model. Um, it, it, you, you, it will always have an opportunity for people to go to where they want to go. Our agents probably, if you ask them, would you ever want to go to work for Redfin, they would say no, because I don't want to be an employee. Likewise, Redfin employees would say, you know, they're not reason they're not at EXP because they would rather be in that model. So um, what's going to be the successful model? I think it depends upon, uh, I believe, if you're going to be a national company, uh, which, which we are, and you want to take advantage of the scale of being a national company, um, trying to build an employee-based uh, system um, is extremely difficult. And in the long run, all things we're talking about and what gets people into real estate at the beginning of, of their path is the idea that they want to build their own business. 
and that's antithetical to an employer-employee relationship. Sometimes I wish we could have more control over our agents because you can build brand better that way, but that's not the deal, and we love our agents in their independent ways. And I think for us, it's scalability, broad-based, and at the end of the day, using that scalability to deliver more value to help our agents close more deals. More questions? Go ahead. Yeah, just to know, from each of you individually, how you think Project Upstream and Public Portal are going to affect the industry, and also individually your business models, how much you're going to do. So let me just repeat that. The question was about Upstream and the Broker Public Portal. How is it going to affect their individual business models? You want to start? Yeah, sure. I'll start. So Project Upstream is, you know, to put it simply for those of you who don't really understand what it is, is a initiative to kind of provide a central ad edit system that will allow you to add your listings and edit your listings and have them filtered to the different platforms or MLSs or websites that you choose to push them down to as an agent or a brokerage. And if you kind of think about that on the local level in Austin, if we had the ability to, you know, load in one place and choose to put your listing in, you know, the various MLSs that surround the Austin area without having to add them multiple times or maybe put it in HAR without having to add it a second time. That's really what Upstream would give us. And Austin is not a hugely fragmented market at this point. We have a pretty good share with Actress and ABOR in most of the market that we serve. So it's not as urgent, I don't think, here as it is in a lot of other areas. So I don't know that it affects me right away in a good or bad way. The Broker Public Portal is an initiative to provide sort of a broker-led alternative to the non-public portals, I would say the publicly held portals. The Broker Public Portal is, I view it as kind of another association website that will draw traffic away from my website, Redfin's website, Keller Williams' website, but will also draw traffic hopefully away from Zillow and Trulia and Realtor.com. So, you know, where that falls, you know, is ultimately who it helps and who it hurts. If it does get out of the gate strong remains to be seen. But I think that it's a good idea in general because I do think that in the long run we're doing ourselves as an industry a disservice by allowing these companies, these publicly held media companies, to provide our e-signature platforms and to provide our CRM and our next thing it's going to be flyers and brochures and signs and lock boxes and, you know, at that point I don't know what role the brokers who don't really, really innovate will have and, you know, the agents will really view their association more with a Zillow or Trulia type entity potentially than they do with a Keller Williams or Realty Austin, you know, or Redfin. So that's my perspective. Interesting. I think we have a different perspective right here. So pretty familiar with both Broker Public Portal and Upstream. I think Broker Public Portal is dead on arrival. And not that it's not a good... I wish you'd just please just say what you mean. And it's because the industry... Um, to pull off that project as an industry initiative is in, it's impossible. There's just too many interests at, that goes into that. And I think what you're seeing is the result of that. So not that it's not a great idea. I just don't think it's going to happen because of how the industry works with each other. Mm -hmm. um, upstream. Um, I, uh, I love Upstream uh, in the context that as a national brokerage company, I would love if I could today tell every one of our EXP agents, you have a central screen to put in all of your listing data. And I don't care whether you belong to the Austin um, uh, Board of Realtors or the you know, CRMLS in California or the Houston Association or uh, San Antonio SABOR, what doesn't, doesn't matter. You're all going to access the data in one way and we're gonna, it's going to be standardized across our, our company in 50 states. I would love that be awesome right so from a from a from a national brokerage perspective I think upstream is a really really great initiative and as it develops we'll be very interested in, in participating um, depending upon the cost um, the thing that I don't that I don't get in upstream is 
how it benefits a local broker. So if I'm Jonathan Boatwright, right, and I am Realty Austin, and I'm sitting here in Austin, and, and most of my business is in Austin, and we belong to the Austin Board of Realtors, I, and, and Austin Board of Realtors, and I think Tim Dane is in the room somewhere. Um, there you are, Tim. Tim. Tim's gonna give you the ability to have your own method whether it's through AMP or some other way of creating your own entry into the MLS system so you can brand that and customize that and create a differentiator to your agents and how you access data into the system, why would he ever go to an upstream platform? I don't get that, right? Um, so maybe Carrie can tell us why that would be the case. But to me, I think upstream for a certain number of brokers is, will be great. For a significant number of local brokers, I think there's a big disconnect um, in many ways as to the why. Mm -hmm. Carrie? So everyone keeps pointing to me um, mm -hmm. about, about Upstream. So I, I actually serve on the board of directors for Upstream, um, which has been an amazing experience to see every major competitor. We have um, brokerage private label realty here in town that's actually on the board of directors as well. We have every major franchise. Um, we have small, medium, large firms that all sit on the board of directors. And we put our competitive hats away and we come into a room and say, what problem are we trying to solve? And I feel like we hit on pieces of the problem. But let's take a bigger picture um, of really what the problems are that we're, of the, what we're solving. Um, and it's not one thing. I always like to, as we look at this, what I love to hear is the different perspectives. Um, we, have a, we have an exercise that I do with my teams. It's a beach ball. You know, the different colored stripes. So when we're trying to make sure everyone shares their perspective, we throw the beach ball around. Because I want to see the slice from everybody. Everyone has a different perspective on upstream on what value it will bring to you. And that doesn't make one, one perspective different or wrong than the other. They provide different values to all different types of organizations. So we all got together and sat down and said, what is the massive problem that we're trying to solve? And one is, it goes back to Jonathan, when you talk, we're talking about being able to negotiate with Zillow, they've been able to actually do a lot of what they've done because we're so fragmented. Because we're negotiating individual brokers at a time or individual MLSs. You know, we have 750 MLSs, 740 MLSs in the country. We have 750 offices, if that gives you perspective on how fragmented this part of the industry is. That's a problem. We created our own mess. Then we also started taking a step back and say, well, do we create a portal? Do we create this? No, the problem is we need a better way. Let's think bigger. Let's think five, ten years out <laughs> as an industry. If we try and really rethink, things have changed. We created this structure in the 80s. When I was in, let's see here, in 94, I bought my first home, and I was so excited because I happened to find a site called Realtor.com, and a house matched what my agent sent me. It was mind-boggling at that time. We created the structure in the 80s. So it's not meeting the needs of what we have today, but we're also kind of stuck in where we are today with what we want to do. Tim's one of the best MLS directors and executives out there, and I've worked with a lot of them. And he's very progressive. Let's make it so we can be very progressive as an MLS. So big picture, how do we actually re-change that flow of information so that we have, as, as, as I said, we enter at one place, it filters out. Whether you belong to one MLS, 10, 15, you enter at once, it goes to all those, meets all their different business rules. As a small broker, you only belong to MLS, one MLS, why does this matter to you? For a couple different reasons. One is, you may be capturing more information about listings or have your own workflow that's outside the MLS, we build that in for you. We say, let's capture that. What you do as a brokerage, let's capture that up front so that when it's feeding to the MLS, it's also feeding to how you operate as a brokerage too. So we can capture that information when you get set up on the system immediately. So now we've created that efficiency. We're also, all you have to do is say, I want to add this vendor. It's my accounting vendor. Let's not talk about the portals anymore. It's not about sending out your listings. That's one piece of it. Are you efficiently sending the right information to your accounting package, to your marketing vendors? I have a new marketing vendor that I want to get started with tomorrow so they can do a test for me. I add them, they get access, they now suddenly have access to my listings, and they can start creating something for my agents tomorrow. That's what we want to be able to achieve. That's the efficiencies and the economies of scale. When we do go back and talk about the portals and marketing your listings, that fragmentation piece, if everything is housed, and while we cannot collude, we cannot price fix, we cannot have any antitrust issues, if every bit of listings comes through one system, it shouldn't just be Keller Williams that actually has the power to negotiate. And I'm going to say that as a representative of Keller Williams up here. It's great that we have it. We shouldn't. Every one of us should all be able to say this is what you can do with our listings. If we keep them separate and negotiate separate and have everything so fragmented across the nation, it'll never change. 
So big picture, that's what we're looking for for Upstream. It's not about just how can I choose to send my listings to Zillow easier. That's not what it's about. It's how do we reorder that flow of information so that you can meet your business needs today. And by the way, it's not just listing information. It's are you struggling when you do want to change as a CRM? As an individual broker, the cost of having to store that information, you now have a cloud database for free. That's part of it. So when you're talking about your accounting software, your roster records, your information about your employees, that actually can be stored in there, and that's actually part of the service that comes with it. So it's not just listings, it's not just, just syndication. There's benefits across the board. So that's, that's why we get very passionate about what Upstream is um, and what the potential it can do. So when you think about it, when you hear about it, don't think about how we operate today. <clears throat> think about the future of what could be better of how we can do that. Um, so that's Upstream in a nutshell. Um, broker Pro, oh, question. I'm just curious on So that's the big question, and I know we're, we're crazy when we come out, we say we don't know what it's going to cost. Um, that we've looked at models for by listing, by brokerage, um, and normally it's not a way that we'd actually roll out any product to say we're going to roll it out and then we're going to figure out what it's going to cost. The reason why we did that is because, to be quite honest, there are the companies who are building this that are offering it out that I really don't believe should actually be in control of how we manage our listing inventory throughout the process. And so let's get it out there. Let's work with NAR has funded it. So let's see how far down. Is that a down. good thing? It's a double-edged sword. <laughs> um, we, took a, we had a lot of contemplation about NAR funding it. Um, we have very tight controls. They actually don't have any authority. We still, the brokers um, and franchises, um, all members, we actually govern it. We kept 100% of the governance with Upstream. NAR is providing the funding and providing RPR. Um, so that means, though, can we use the economies of scale so we can get it down to little or no cost? I hope so. Um, if, it's, if it's cost prohibitive, we can't even do it. Um, but we need to prove the concept that it's there. So if we, all we can guarantee is that it's not going to be cost prohibitive or else we'll stop the entire project before we roll it out to everybody. So, Carrie, I'm going to ask you to talk briefly about the Broker Public Portal as well, which was the second part of the question. Yep. Broker Public Portal. Um, so we, we're active on that as well. It's a great competitor. Um, as I said earlier, providing extra competition um, to some of the big portals is a good thing. Uh, right now, they're pretty much in the driver's seat. So we need to add some other drivers to the road. Um, and Broker Public Portal, we're involved in the board to make sure that they adhere to what, as the ent entire industry, representing the listing agent, representing the listing brokerage, um, really doing the right thing, never selling the leads back. Um, those are the core things that went awry, um, to be perfectly candid with Realtor.com. Um, it was supposed to represent the industry and you have to pay in order to have your own branding on it. Let's not do that path again. So we're very actively involved to make sure that we don't go down that path. And we're not. It's a, it's a great product. If it doesn't work, will there be something else? Absolutely. Um, we need a, a great portal presence um, that will represent the industry and represent listing agents and listing brokerages really well. So okay. that's right. That's why we support it. Awesome. So, Glenn, what's your opinion? Upstream, Burger Public Portal. I'm not sure I have anything to add to the conversation. I mean, if you want, I'll explain our position, but I think you've heard it from the other folks. If you okay. want, I can do it. But Is there anything that we should know about those positions? That's. I would prefer to see an investment in making brokerage websites better than building the Broker Public Portal. I don't know enough about it to say whether it can be competitive, but that would just be my bias. Mm -hmm. And do you think Upstream will help or hurt Redfin? Or is that even the right way to frame the question? I don't think we should worry about Redfin when thinking about Upstream. I don't think Upstream was conceived to help or to hurt Redfin. Um, I think there's a way that it could be good for the industry. I think there's a way that it could fail. Um, the, the issue for me is just that I think the brokers want the MLSs to be better advocates. Mm -hmm. um, and I try to support the MLSs as our advocate. I think we're fragmenting in a way that, that sometimes doesn't help our cause. I think that I think the one thing that is clear is that whether upstream is successful or not, 
um, is going to push the MLSs to be more advo advocate to brokers. There's no mm -hmm. question. That's happening right now. Um, it will continue to happen. And um, uh, hopefully that is a net positive and doesn't get you know drawn down into right. um, battles um, that people look at as a way to get better as opposed to fight. So Sometimes that, the does that. that kind of does seem like a natural segue into consolidation, MLS consolidation, pro, con. What do you think about some of the national trends? It seems un uncontroversial among everyone here that the MLSs should consolidate. The only people who don't think the MLSs should consolidate are the people running small MLSs. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh -huh. More questions from the audience? Anybody? Wow, it's a quiet group. Here's one. Oh, there's one. Go ahead. What do you guys, I'm Brian Tyler with Regent Property Group. What do you think that ABOR can do better and our board of directors can do better to help <laughs> The question was, what can ABOR do better to help these fine people, but also everyone in this room? I think it's one of the best associations in the country. I do ride this hobby horse around listing attribution. I think it's the one issue where when we've seen that happen, we've seen brokerage traffic increase. Not to our site, uh, since we don't have the largest listing share, but just generally the, the allocation of traffic between brokerage sites and other real estate websites, brokerage sites get more traffic. And we're just so invested in the MLS ecosystem right now that we always advocate for anything that would help it. I, I would like to see um, you take the lead in regionalizing MLSs in Texas and Central Texas. Is this Central Texas? Mm -hmm. Central Texas, Central sorry. Texas. Um, I'm a West Coast guy. Um, <laughs> Austin. Um, uh, because at the end of the day, if you look at you know a state like Texas, um, y you should, how many MLSs in Texas? 82. How many? 82. Uh -huh. 82. Are there really 82? 82. 82. Okay, that's absurd. That's, that's just absurd, okay? And, and so um, as, a, a, as a company who wants data from all those MLSs and going to have agents in all those MLSs, um, that makes our life horrible. Um, and, uh, and so I would say find a way to regionalize your MLS here in Central Texas and, and be, do, do what Trend and MRIS did in, on, the, on the East Coast. Right, they brought two massive MLSs together. It was no, it, you know, unbelievable feat to do that. But they did it, and and it takes some courage and some leaders to, to step out. Uh, you've got Tim, um, you've got the other guy with a great tie over there. <laughs> um, you, you use those. You use your leaders to make it happen because you can make it happen, right? And and that will benefit us. So I, I, first of all, want to applaud everybody for coming to this as well as everybody that's watching on live stream because I think from sitting the last three years or so on the MLS committee, um, we've tried to do various surveys to get member input or email, email survey, emails especially to try to get the members to weigh in and, and get educated about the topics and provide their feedback on what direction the association could take. And um, I know, what's the open rate on your emails? Like, 15% or something like that? I mean, it's... 35. Okay, 35%, yeah. Uh, the click, it's still not very good. Um, and, and there's maybe, I don't know, 100, 150 people here tops that, that you know, came out to this. And the way that our association gets better is through um, people who um, rely on this association for their livelihood, getting involved in the decision-making process and having their voices heard and signing up for committees and, and you know, running for uh, leadership positions. And that's what it really takes. And, and I would encourage you all to, to get involved because um, change doesn't happen if you don't get involved. Well, that's fantastic. So I want to thank everyone for coming today. Thank you Great so much opinions. for having us. Thank, thank you so you. much. I think Aaron has a few words. That was, a, that was a great panel that we had today, and I, I want to, again, reiterate, thank you all for coming out. Um, we, uh, as, here at ABOR, we try to, um, to serve you guys better uh, and have more events like this. We, we, we have, I don't know, we've had four or five forums this year, and we're going to continue doing this through the, through the years. Um, if 
you're not a member of ABOR and you're a member of a neighboring association and you're thinking about joining um, another association, ABOR right now is waiving all of, all of our um, startup fees for you to join. So if you're interested in, in uh, hearing about uh, more of the services we provide, we've got three locations now. We've got a, we've got a, um, a north location. Uh, that's over up in Cedar Park. We've got a and we've got a south new south location that's coming up at uh, Manshack and Slaughter. So we're we're moving our for those of you that live south. We're starting a new uh, south location. It's going to be uh, we bought a new building down there, a small little space, and um, it's it's going to be just south of Manshack and Slaughter. So uh, anyway, uh, again, thanks to all of our panelists. Um, and if you have any questions. For any of us afterwards, uh, I'm sure we'll be hang around for for a few minutes. And uh, thanks again, and everybody have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Guys, I'll let you mingle. I'll have my office open so you can come pick up your bags.